The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Welcome back to another lecture on The Planets by Gustav Holst, this time covering the movement Jupiter, bringer of jollity. This is a really infectious, really cinematic, really upbeat piece, and actually as I am preparing to tell you all about it, I'm actually feeling really upbeat just thinking about this music. It's almost overwhelmingly positive. Yes, it does have some moments of mystery, it has some moments of reverence, but largely it's just a hugely optimistic piece, and there's just no way to keep that out of the lecture, out of the way I'm feeling about telling you about it. As with all of these lectures, let's start with the orchestra first of all, to see how it differs from, or resembles, previous orchestra lineups in this suite. We saw in the introduction that Mars, Uranus, and Jupiter had the biggest orchestras, the biggest numbers, and had some of the loudest scoring. The winds are quite a bit like Mars, with a couple of differences. A pair each of piccolos and flutes. Three oboes and English horn. Notice we're not using bass oboe here, so the third oboe can just stick to their instrument. Three clarinets and bass clarinet three bassoons, and contrabassoon. Six horns, like Venus, in pairs, three sets of two, rather than two sets of three, four trumpets in C, and we're going to need them with some of the big scoring that's ahead, two tenor trombones, bass trombone, and our little pair of high and low tubas, six timpani, with two players, then a bit of a kitchen sink of percussion, triangle, tambourine, cymbals, bass drum, and so on, plus glockenspiel. Now, not all of these players are going to be playing at the same time, and I'm sure that this can be boiled down to just two or three players, rather than five players. Two harps, and then, of course, our standard lineup of string players. As for the key signature... Everything is in C to begin with. There will be a change to E flat in the middle of this movement and a very brief section of B major towards the end. But the overwhelmingly positive key of C major dominates this piece. To add to all of that, Holst marks Allegro Giocoso, so Allegro in a joking way. Now from the very first three notes, we get the atomic structure of this piece, E, G, A. So in other words, up a third, up a second. We're going to see this melodic fragment reappear here and there all over the place. And sometimes even just the idea of rising up a major second, which will reappear in much of the thematic material of this piece. In fact, right here, which we'll talk about in a second, simply playing A, B in the violas, which is the same concert pitches as this E, F sharp, shows that Holst is using that interval from the very beginning. But let's talk a little bit more about this part right here. This has fascinated a lot of orchestrators and has probably been one of those sections where a lot of great composers and orchestrators wish that they'd come up with this idea. Second violin start off with E, G, A, and it just repeats E, G, A, E, G, A, and so on. First violins come in with A, C, D, A, C, D. Now, the A, C, D immediately transfers itself to Divisi second violins and just continues on. So you've got both of those patterns, E, G, A, and A, C, D going on. Meanwhile, the first violins just keep leaping up to the same E, G, A that the second violins are playing an octave lower. And then adding on the A, C, D, just like they did. Since all of these motivic fragments are happening at different times, it has this 
strange effect on the listener, really trying to nail down what's happening and never quite being able to really feel where everything sits. And that is intentional, obviously. It's almost as if the listener's getting carried away by just a big charge of positivity. Jollity, right? In other words, if people don't know what the word jollity means, it means just a feeling of joy. So Jupiter is the bringer of all things that have to do with happiness, positivity, increase, and so on. This is also an early example of trying to imitate the sense of echo without actually having any kind of echo machine. There is a kind of an echoing feeling because of the offsetting of the two different motivic fragments placed an octave apart. This also resembles in a lot of ways the use of sonic wallpaper, using blocks of sound as a backdrop to other things going on. Now, finally, let's talk about the entrance of the first theme. And as I mentioned before, we have that rising major second played unison by violas, cellos, and all six horns. So you get a very, very focused, very, very intense sound. And once again, just really trying to keep things positive and upbeat and happy. The whole mood is built right into the melodic curve of this phrase. Notice how a lot of the motion is upward using this written D sounding G as a little bit of an anchor from which further melodic exploration can sort of leap upwards, coming back down to it, and then leaping up an octave to accentuate once again written E to F sharp, sounding A to G, and then coming back to that D in a very powerful way. From this tutti hit, this lovely <laughs> repeating pattern just stretches itself across all of the strings. The highest pattern here is just giving over to unison violins and then the EGA pattern is taken over by the seconds, and so on. Violas take over this lower pattern, and cellos, still in tenor clef here, take over the lowest pattern, which is very easy for them to do. The reason for the unification of all of these strings is simply because Holst does not need these lower strings for the melody anymore, and also, with the massive tutti passage that is about to happen, he needs as much strength that he can in each voice. Here's an example of how abandoning Divisi will actually strengthen the strings. Now, it's not an issue where there isn't a lot of competition, for instance, right here. But it is an issue when things get enormous, as they will on the next page. Something that I'll note here as well is that Holst has built a forte piano crescendo right into the structure of the scoring. Rather than having these two trumpet players go forte piano, they just start off piano and then build from this big accent. And it can actually fool the listener into thinking that the trumpets did a forte piano crescendo, but they didn't. And this is all very simple scoring of a C major chord. You know, you've got your C thirds on top, doubled by piccolos and flutes. You've got a 6-4 chord with G as the lowest note. And this is also that same C in the middle. And then this octave and a fourth is actually G, C, G, covering some of the same pitches. That actually gives us the G in between this E and that C, right? And then we've got an octave and a fifth on C with the bassoons and then a low octave with the double bassoon. <clears throat> which is doubled by the double basses, just playing a very, very loud pizzicato. And then tenor trombones get the lower middle voices and bass tuba and so on, covering the low note. And we have both C and G in the timpani, with the lower G really just sounding kind of like C when it's combined with the upper voice. Remember, as I was saying before, in a previous instance of this kind of timpani scoring, when you stack timpani pitches like this, generally speaking, 
the lower one tends to just mix in with the sound of the higher one, especially when they're in fourths like this. You would have to really hear a subtle passage of scoring to be able to distinguish the two pitches. So when you hear this hit, you probably will notice that you don't really even hear the G from the timpani at all, but you just do hear a massive strike from both timpani players. Going on, we see the trumpet getting louder and louder and louder till it gets to this fortissimo, and then it takes a break, allowing everybody else in the orchestra to freak out for a few bars. Notice that the winds come in and start to basically just double the pitches of the violins. This looks like a lot of busy stuff going on, but really the only new material here is played by the piccolos, which are basically doing what the Divisi first violins were doing on the previous page, only an octave higher. However, there is one really cool effect happening in the flutes, and that is a literal echo kind of scoring between the first and second flutes. So the second flute is basically doubling the first violin part, but the first flute comes in and steps on its toes, starting one sixteenth note late. So the same exact notes are just playing one quarter of a beat behind, and it creates even more of an echo type of sense. Third oboe is doubling the violas. First and second oboes, ah two, are doubling the second violins. And the first and second clarinets, however, you see that same, just a semi-quaver late type scoring. So these notes are actually concert EGA. Who is playing EGA in that register? It is the second violins. But if you just use your eyes here, you can see this little note is saying, hey, play it just a little bit late. So this E is coming in right there on the second semiquaver of the second violins. So you've got that same echoing sound coming from those particular clarinets. English horns, however, are just doubling the cellos. And the third clarinet is helping out with the violas along with the third oboe. So you can see, aside from the piccolos icing the top there, an octave higher than the first and second violins, and the first flute and first and second clarinets coming in a semi-quaver late, this is really just doubling of the strings. But those little extra added elements really, really do add a sense of just complete bombastic, flurrying craziness. Uh, it's almost like the Minads, the ancient Greek spirits who were kind of slightly crazy in their jubilance and could, you know, rip you apart because they were so happy about what they were celebrating. So we're getting this sense of being carried away by joy, but it's a really, really great way to start this movement. The same theme from before is now going to be played in the low winds, bass clarinet, bassoons, and contrabassoon. Right here, these bass clarinets are actually playing the same pitches as the bassoons. Just remember your transposition of down a ninth, right? So down a ninth from B below middle C is A at the bottom of the bass staff, right? So when you add these low winds to the tenor tuba and bass tuba playing in octaves plus tenor trombone, it just really gives it a humongous sound. Double basses on the bottom, doubling the contrabassoon, and the timpani doubling the melody throughout. I think it's a really terrific unison melody. I tend to downplay the use of the timpani to play complete bass lines where the player has to just completely retune all the time in order to get all the pitches. And there are even chromatic pitches and almost a walking bass that the composer is trying to score. And this has not happened just in student scores, but I've also had clients who have attempted to score timpani into their bass line. And this is actually not a bass line, right? It is actually thematic. The six pitches that the timpani are tuned to are the exact same pitches that Hulse needs in order 
for the timpani to play the full melody along with all the other low instruments in the orchestra. One last thing to note about the scoring of this melodic passage, and that is that it starts out as a triple octave. This is A below middle C. This is the A at the bottom of the staff, and this is A an octave lower than that. What's kind of cool is with this rising 16th note group, the two voices condense into just a plain octave playing below middle C. And there will be a certain amount of energy in that. There will be a sense of lift, even though the pitches are not actually getting a whole lot higher. It's just that the telescoping of the three octave positions into two octave positions gives a sense of huge lift, especially if everybody is really playing fortissimo and really giving it their all. You'll hear this particularly in the brass, that sense of power, to the point where you almost don't even notice that the timpani drop out. Finally, we get to this big frantic triple F, which is almost like a big payoff. Now you'll notice that a lot of orchestras approach this dynamic as triple F to P, and then building again, just because that is such an exciting thing to do. But that more properly happens later on in this piece, something similar to that idea. So to give it away here, I think, is just a little too much. I mean, I like that effect too. It's almost involuntary, as if the orchestra and the conductor can't help themselves. They just want to go, bum, 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 right? But it's just really better, I think, in the long run to hit this, as a triple F and just sit on it and blast away any last shred of doubt from the audience that this is really, really happy music. So let's unpack a little bit about the way that this tutti is scored. Tremolo strings, which allows them to keep hitting these pitches at a very furious rate. That's one of the benefits of tremolo. On the one hand, it robs you of a nice sustained tone, but on the other, you can just keep scratching away at the string very, very loudly, and it can add a lot of excitement as well. I don't recommend it all the time, but this is a really great example of using it to keep the string sound in the game. And then after that, we've got a pretty standard bass line walking uphill in the lower strings, and we've got the octave melody spread out between first violins and divisi seconds at first just boiling down into unison right here. Now notice that the violas are taking a middle voice approach and not doubling the melody at yet another octave below. And if you look at the way that the melody is scored here, that's pretty much the approach that Holst is taking throughout. It's really only the trumpets that are taking the melody lower down to middle C here. But even at that, the two parts combine up to a higher C at this point. So Holst is trying to keep the melody out from the middle of the scoring. But all very well harmonized all the same, with oboes and English horn forming a little harmonic block against the melody. Same thing with the clarinets. However, Bass clarinet is being used to its full advantage as a bass instrument, along with the bassoons and contrabassoon, not to mention the two tubas playing in octaves, and the bass trombone. The second trombone helps out a little bit too, but then gives itself over to holding on to the harmony here. If we look at the timpani, we notice that Holst is combining both the function of the bass line and the melody into one part. So we have the D and the E of the bass line. We have the C of the melody here. We have the A and the B of the bass line going on to D and E. And then we are ending on a G as both parts come together. And this D here is just a complementary pitch to the A in the melody and the F sharp in the bass line. Complementary pitches really get you out of a jam when you're trying to have timpani on every stroke of the bass line and you really only have four timpani or three timpani or whatever. 
and your bass line is very consonant. I think it's cool here how Holst is making the best of both worlds with the pitches that he's got. And of course I could unpack a lot of these 2T chords, but I think that that is getting to be a little bit of a drag on describing everything. But just to notice here that the third trumpet is doubling this top E here, and that the low trumpets are playing A2 on the top line. So third and fourth trumpet do not have to be limited to a lower roll at all times. I love this higher scoring here in the horns. It just gives a very, very bright, very emphatic, maybe even urgent tone to the way that this piece is harmonized. The trade-off is with that much power at the top, it really kind of tends to blow away anything else that's happening in terms of harmony and the winds and the strings. So you just have to use that wisely. Let's listen to all of that now. Wow, that was a lot of stuff for me to explain just going into this piece. But I think you can remember most of those points. The little intersecting motives, the way that on the previous page you had all six horns being doubled by the middle strings, the viola and cello played higher. Then the way that this sort of rotating pattern comes back into the winds and how the first flute and first and second clarinets A2 play some of those same motives but a 16th note late so that the combination of the winds and strings here represent a very mind-boggling sonic background to this huge low wind and low brass unison. Listen also for the melodic timpani and I will see you on the next page. After that enormous tutti, Holst really brings things down now to just tremolo violins and violas and a four horns playing this interesting quartal melody, in other words, a melodic arc that covers a series of fourths. And this has been imitated all over the place. Bum 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 dun 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 right it's <laughs> almost just says space all over it. It's the music of the future, stacking fourths. And I have to say that I use stacked fourths and stacked fifths in my music all the time, and I'm sure that I'm picking it up from Holst, and I think it was also used by Mussorgsky and a lot of other composers. Copland actually used stacked fifths a lot, as well as stacked fourths. But when you think about it, the basic atomic structure of the themes to this piece, dun dun dun, dun 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 dun, actually covers a fourth, right? So, say like E G A E A E A, a melodic fourth is sort of built right into it already. So if you just follow that and just go dun dun dun, dun dun dun, dun 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 dun, it's still of a piece with the basic motivic idea. Some of that is also built into this, the sense of suspension that that implies. So here you've got a C fifth being tremoloed, and here you've got a D fourth being tremoloed. That sets up a sense of suspension between the C and the D. Anyhow, not to get too much into harmony. But going on, you can see that you have a very full sound from violins doubled by clarinets and bassoons. The clarinets taking the top three voices pretty much right out of the violin parts, and then the bassoons covering the lower and middle strings. What's really nice here is that in a balanced way, you will not actually hear the winds very much at all. You'll just hear a very rich string tone. So tips for future orchestrators. Here's a really, really good example of using doubling in a way that makes the strings sound a lot richer without necessarily going for a blended tone. 
we go back to tremolo in the strings, and this time the trumpets are playing a variation of this idea, evolving away from the strictly quartal type of idea with perfect fourths stacked together. So this time we have a major third and then a diminished fifth. Not to get into that too much, but it allows for some interesting interplay between trumpet giving over to the upper winds with a two piccolos being doubled by the flutes who then drop an octave so as not to play this B too high. Then oboes playing an octave lower than that, doubled by the B flat clarinets. These are the same pitches here. That has just a really cutting sound. So if you really wanted to know what it sounds like when the flutes above and the oboes and clarinets team up below with a lot of weight on both lines, then that's what it sounds like. Check this out, I would say. What's interesting is that all of that tone weight from all of those instruments equals one loudly played trumpet. So even the trumpet being played at forte and all of these instruments being played at fortissimo, to an extent, the winds are a little bit stronger than that trumpet, but the trumpet could easily blow them all away could easily blow everybody away in the orchestra if they were really playing loudly enough. Same goes for the trombone and bass drum and so on. There are some instruments that can just dominate everything with hardly any effort, and first trumpet is definitely one of them. The interplay continues with just a bar of each, winds answering with some of the upper strings, both first and second trumpet coming in, the bassoons playing off of it from below, so it's this nice interweaving pattern that is working its way down. We saw some of that in Mercury, and certainly Mercury is a development to an extent of this kind of idea that sort of steps on the toes of the next idea as it climbs down or up. But of course, Mercury was written afterwards, so really Mercury is a development of this rather than the other way around. Let's have a listen to that, taking things in smaller chunks for a little while. Listen for the sound of the four horns against the tremolo strings. Listen for the way that the clarinets and bassoons blend in more seamlessly with the sound of the strings played on lower pitches. The sense of urgency and evolution of melodic arc represented by just one single trumpet being answered by all of these upper winds playing back and forth and sort of stepping on each other's toes as they wend their way downwards. On this next page, I feel we can see that Holst's sense of form is really impeccable. If he had wanted to be a more academic kind of composer and focus on symphonic writing and sonatas and things like that, I think he could have explored the form in a really beautiful way and brought new light to musical structure. But it's enough to see that he did some very cool things, even in these more free-form fantasies that he was composing for orchestra here. And also he did a lot of really beautiful tone poems that I'd love to look over sometime in a regular orchestration lesson. Here we're getting the sense of teasing out a big melodic episode to come. Once again, returning to the whole idea of up a third, up a second. Bum bum bum, bum bum bum, bum 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 bum. Now this looks kind of strange, even if you're really getting used to transposing by now in F, with this A-flat here and this C-sharp there in the violins. But really, that is the same exact note. Thinking and harmonically, A flat down a fifth being D flat, which is the enharmonic equivalent of C sharp. So it's just spelled in a slightly different way to make it easier to read, maybe a little bit more instinctive for the horn player. This is all very simply constructed, really. The clarinet and the bassoon taking some of these lower pitches that are in the lower strings. The first violins doubling the A2 first and second horns, and it's just really a solid sound. If you were thinking of emulating really heroic scoring, this is a really great example of that right there. 
just and it's very direct it's almost like a sword cutting through the air holst keeps returning to the strings playing tremolo while the rest of the instruments react or introduce new thematic material notice here that the trumpets go back to a quartal approach with the melody bum 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 but really really high and so that a sounds very very piercing beautiful sound of the c trumpet there really is a difference between b flat and c trumpet and you can hear it especially on the higher notes which are lighter and a bit more penetrating on the c compared to the b flat here the flutes and piccolos just basically play that same exact idea from the beginning of the piece only of course up an octave and that gives a little sonic cover for the oboes and clarinets and english horn along with the ah two trumpets and lower strings to come in right under it and develop the idea of this passage here a little bit more bum 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 i think by now you can probably start to recognize certain parallels in massive scoring like this like the way that the oboes and the clarinets are basically playing the same exact pitches here and how this note right here is actually doubling at an octave the top note of the bassoons here so this is a concert c in the staff which is the same note as this an octave higher and then this c sharp here is actually an f sharp and that is the same note as this f sharp here and the f sharps written c sharps in the horns and so on all the same I think that on your own, it would be kind of nice for you to unpack these chords here and see exactly how they are written out across the orchestra, because there's just a big lesson in the way that all of these elements come together in these really, really nice, satisfying chords. It's the kind of thing that would have been imitated a lot by mid-20th century orchestrators and composers, especially in film. Let's have a listen to that, just trying to keep these little breaks happening a little bit more frequently so you can really absorb all the things that I'm saying. So listen to the very prominent sound of Atu horns doubling all of the violins together and the way that it really comes together in a, in a beautiful chord at the end. And then the very penetrating sound of the trumpet here under all of these flutes and piccolos going wild. And the way that all the winds Ah, two horns and lower strings come together in this lovely unison melody here, spreading out harmonically, and then ending in another satisfying chord that has more winds in it. The next page is very similar to the previous one and is even more trumpet solely than anything else that we saw in terms of that careful scoring. Once again, violins are going back to a sort of a default tremolo background, along with the flutes going wild on those opening intersecting bits of motive, although notice that the pitch has changed here to E flat G A rather than E G A. So there is a little bit of harmonic eccentricity being added to kind of wind up more and more excitement with this crescendo, with the clarinets joining in for a little bit of tone weight on similar pitches. This is basically just doubling what's going on in the flutes. If there's something to really study on this page, I would say it's just the way that the second trumpet and first trumpet trade off. It's nice to give the second trumpet player a few lines here and there, especially because a lot of times they can be really, really good players. Co-principles, in a way. And then here you get a lovely sound of ah uh, four trumpets. And hearing all four of those trumpets just really joined together on this scoring has an extremely forceful sound and a great cinematic scoring type sound. You might as well just get used to the fact that I'm going to return to that again and again talking about different ways that this scoring has been applied cinematically, or could be applied cinematically, or should be applied cinematically. About the only comment that I've got to say about this tutti is that I think that it's really cool how the oboes and English horn are the middle voice of this big woodwind harmony, 
rather than being like the top voice or doubling the top voice with the flutes. And also how nice and spread out this chord is in the heavy brass. Notice there being no horns at all. So it has a much brighter sound when it just goes oomph. It's essentially a staccato, an accent of a short duration followed by a little comma, a breath in the orchestra. So just boom. So listen for all of those things as we take another brief break. The sounds of the trumpets doubling up, quadrupling up, the slight harmonic changes to the rotating motive parts to give more and more interest and more and more tension as things wind up towards the end of the page. And also listen to the brightness of this chord with the horns taken out. At figure three, we see the beginning of a theme that is taken directly from that opening motive. Bum bum bum, da 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 da. And then developing from there. Dun 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 dun. Without picking it apart too much, I'm really interested in the scoring. We can see that it is ah oh, six horns, along with all of the strings except for the double basses. It's marked very heavy, non-legato, so not smooth at all. And there will be a sense of unity with the horns that is somewhat crude, really. Um, I don't think that this sound is supposed to be smooth and generous and warm. I think it's supposed to be kind of brutal. A bit of forced jollity here. Almost kind of scary in a way. I think a lot of us who compose things and be creative and write and so on and so forth tend to be more contemplative, more quiet people. And this kind of jollity, to use that word, can be a little bit intimidating. And I would guess that that might be part of what is being expressed here. It's not necessarily the smoothest ride for us introverts. The scoring here is almost brutally direct, too. It's uh, bass tuba and double basses doubling on the same exact pitches, along with this little chick going on with the trombone. So boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. Very, very obvious kinds of scoring. And it's so simple that it bears almost no analysis, really. It's enough just to listen to that very, very blunt sound that is happening here. Then all of the standard models of winds sweep up towards what's happening on the next page, which is essentially the woodwind chorale version of what we just heard. The double basses and tuba take a break, and the bass line goes into lighter instruments, more lightly played. So first trombone and pizzicato, violas, and cellos taking over the bass line along with bass clarinet. I think that makes a really, really cool combination. And of course, the third clarinet helping out with the same pitches at an octave higher than the bass clarinet. Now you might remember back in Mercury, I was talking about how the use of the glockenspiel could end up with a slightly cloying effect. And I feel that is the case here. Not to say that I dread listening to this, but I think that it's a little comical. This really reminds me a lot of, like, Christmas shopping music. Music that is demonically composed so that it sets a pace for the shopper, who is merrily pushing their trolley down the aisle at a medium speed and grabbing things off shelves and throwing them into their cart. So, <laughs> that's what I... That is the impression that I feel when I listen to this music, especially when you throw in the glockenspiel. It's a jolly Christmas kind of music. But all that aside, I'm not really mocking it. I just think that it's kind of funny the way that so many commercial orchestrators have turned to music like this, and possibly even this passage itself, for tips on how to put shoppers in a good mood. Anyhow, <laughs> just to look at the construction of it, it's all very beautifully harmonized with very, very few pitches doubled, really. The flutes are taking the upper harmonies, with the first piccolo doubling the top line of the flute momentarily, 
and then taking off on its own, adding even higher and higher pitches. Mercifully, the glockenspiel here only covers a couple of notes here and there, and I think that is wise. I think if the glockenspiel doubled the pitch all of the way through, it would just get to be overwhelming. And that might also be a tip that you can think of as well, and that is a little goes a long way, and creates maybe the illusion in the listener's mind that it's being played throughout the entire passage. Especially with such high chirpy melodies and tonalities in the piccolo and first flute. If you want to score like this, just follow a few basics here. I would say keep the oboes and English horns locked in a very nice little four-part harmony as they go. Keep the clarinets in octaves, just as Holst does here. And then have a little harmonization to the melody in the flutes on top of the sound picture, along with the piccolo. And I think that you will have it down perfectly. So let's listen to both of those pages now, the somewhat comically commercial by this point in history, and then the more aggressively happy horns on the previous page. And then we'll take a look at one last page. For this last page, I want to call your attention to some very, very simple scoring that is nonetheless extremely effective. And that is this little back and forth idea in the cellos and double basses, just going back and forth from E to F sharp staccato over and over again. Then when the music changes for four bars and the focus of the tonality goes elsewhere, the same idea is taken up a couple of steps by pizzicato cellos and staccato bass clarinet. So this little underpinning rhythmic figure is actually maintaining the sense of forward motion of the first half of this page. If you were to take that out, it really would not sound quite as convincing. Holst is now revisiting the first real theme in this piece. Dun, 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 first in the strings, with an octave melody between the first violins and violas, harmonized in the middle very simply with these C-thirds and then just changing into pure descending harmony as the flutes and piccolos pick up on that same little motive again and flit their way upwards. And then with octave doubling in the double reeds, the first oboe and first bassoon taking the melody. So this is the same kind of octave melody approach here, except the harmonization by the second and third players under both soloists, with very much the same approach, just repeated E-flat thirds as opposed to C-thirds here. Holst returns to that same quartal idea, this time alternating between a motive starting on D and then one starting on E. And so on. And as it progresses, it adds more and more notes in unison to help it grow even more in intensity as it crescendos for me, the interest here is not so much in the sound of the trumpet, though that's very, very cool. What is more interesting is how the harmony is scored above in the winds. This is, once again, a very outer space cinematic scoring type idea with a lot of suspensions. <laughs> once again, we've talked about suspensions before, but here you have the sense of suspension between the A and the G here with that same interval being played by the oboes, A and G here, C and D there, going back and forth. And that's also something I think you could take the piano score and unpack that a little bit on your own. I also like the way that the pizzicato comes in here in simple octaves for the first violins and sixths and fifths for the seconds. It's cool the way the violas are providing the suspension notes here 
as in the G forming a second with the A here, and the D forming a second with the C here. That's all very nicely scored. So listen to all of those features now, the way that the winds are working together here harmonically over the gradually congregating trumpets in unison, and the way that Pizzicato really adds some firmness and resolve to the upcoming resolution, and also the way that these octave melodies are handled very simply with a very basic back and forth accompaniment in both strings and winds, and this beautiful little flurry adding a little splash of color and motion across the orchestral texture. Listen to all of that, and I will see you in about 10 days to a couple of weeks with part two of Jupiter, the bringer of jollity. Thank you.